2024 Democratic presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. testified on Capitol Hill today in the House Judiciary Select Subcommittee for the Weaponization of the Federal Government hearing. Democratic lawmakers on the committee blasted Kennedy as he testified about censorship, tech companies, and free speech. In fact, here's some of Democratic Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz actually trying to stop Kennedy's testimony as this whole thing was ongoing. Let's watch some of that. 11 Clause 2, which Mr. Kennedy is violative of, I move that we remove into an executive session because Mr. Kennedy has repeatedly made despicable anti-Semitic and anti-Asian comments as recently as last week. Rule 11 Clause 2 says, whenever it is asserted by a member of the committee that the evidence or testimony at a hearing may tend to defame, degrade, or incriminate any person, or it is asserted by a witness that the evidence or testimony that the witness would give at a hearing may tend to defame, degrade, or incriminate the witness, and it goes on. Mr. Kennedy, uh, among many other things, has said, I know a lot now about bioweapons. We put out hundreds of millions of dollars in, into ethnically targeted microbes. The Chinese have done the same thing. In fact, COVID-19, there is an argument that it is ethnically targeted. COVID-19 attacks certain races disproportionately. The races that are most immune to COVID-19 are- Is the lady making a motion or a speech? I, and I've made a motion to move into executive session because Mr. Mr. Kennedy's testimony- Mr. Chairman, I move to table the motion. Meanwhile, Republican Chairman Jim Jordan tweeted in response, Democrats are attempting to censor speech during a censorship hearing. Can't make it up. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. joins Brianna and I here in the studio right now to discuss. Mr. Kennedy, welcome to our program. Thanks for having me back. So you testified today about social media censorship, some of it done at the federal government's behest. And as that was happening, right at the start, members of the federal government actually tried to prevent you from speaking. What did you make of that paradigm happening and unfolding in real time on the very issue you were there to talk well, about? You know, I was censored. You know, there, uh, Judge Doty's decision was released two weeks ago. It was an extraordinary 155-page decision by a federal district judge enjoining the federal government from, uh, from censoring anymore, from, from colluding with social media. In fact, Judge Doty asked the, the White House to have no more contact with any of the social media sites because of the, you know, the magnitude of the censorship. I was in Judge Doty's decision. He mentions that I was the first one that President Biden uh, tried to censor two days after he was sworn in. White House officials called, uh, contacted Facebook and asked them to, to take down my site, which they did, take down my platform, <clears throat> which they did. They took down my entire Instagram site with 900,000 uh, people, and I had no misinformation on there. They, they had to make up a new term called malinformation, and that means information that is true, but nonetheless offensive to federal policies. Uh, so for a long time, I was being censored both by the Trump administration and by the uh, Biden administration. Once I declared for president, it became more difficult. So now they've started this slander offensive against me to, to silence me. This was extraordinary because it, it was a meeting, it was a, a hearing on censorship. And number one, 102 Democrats signed a, a letter uh, asking that I not be allowed to talk. And when I get there, got there, um, the Democrats, each of them, listed all these slanders, all of which are untrue. I've never made an anti-Semitic comment in my life, and I said that under oath, or a racist comment not once in my life. I have a better position on Israel than anybody on that committee and anybody in that chamber. I'm the only one who's asked that President Biden revoke the $2, $2 billion that he's sending to Iran. Oh, but they would, they, they listed all these libels and then they would not allow me to, to reply. So they literally um, made every effort possible to make sure that I couldn't talk. And uh, you know, the issues that I'm talking about are issues that are great concern to American people, not only the First Amendment, but the economic issues, the destruction of the middle class. We need to be able to talk about those things. And this is what I said to the committee. You know, we need, we're, we're a democracy. The, the free flow of information is the sunlight, it's the water, it's the fertilizer for democracy. We are, we are riven now by this kind of polarization of name calling and hatred and vitriol and marginalization and we somehow need to start talking to each other again in a way that's gentle, that's kind, that's dignified, respectful and understanding. 
to ask you a little bit about that, because I think it was anticipated that the Democrats were going to have the response to you that they had going into this hearing. There were a number of statements that were made over the course of the last week or so that seemed to foreground the idea that they were going to focus on your statements that they characterize as anti-Semitic and avoid the substance of the censorship issues that you were there to talk about. And I wonder what you make of the, the, the situation that you're in, where you're running in the Democratic Party. And ostensibly, moments like this, hearings like this, are opportunities to bring the priorities that you care about, like censorship, to the public, <laughs> where they've been siloed for recent history over in a lot of alternative and right-leaning sites. If Democratic electeds are going to have this kind of response to you in a hearing like this, have you thought about strategically how you plan to help Democratic voters prioritize issues like censorship and like some of the other uh, environmental concerns, um, some of the uh, COVID, COVID mandate vaccine concerns that you've raised and which have been very popular in alternative media? Yeah, I, um, that's a really good question. And I, you know, I, I clearly have the DNC against me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not a coincidence that, uh, that Debbie Wasserman Schultz was leading the kind of battle against me. And she's the same individual who was charged with corruption for getting Bernie, you know, who was leading and almost certainly would have won. Right. And she led the, um, you know, the, the DNC's efforts to, uh, to exclude him from the race. So I was not surprised about her attitude toward me. I'm hoping, that, you know, I mean, Bernie found an audience, despite the fact that the entire power structure was against him. And I think I have even an advantage on, on you know, what uh, Bernie Sanders had, because that was before there were podcasts, and that was, you know, he didn't really have the ability to talk to large amounts of grassroots rank-and-file Democrats. Mm. And uh, I'm hoping that, you know, that that will give me a path into um, uh, into the voters in the primary, despite the fact that the DNC is trying to shut me down. I want to give you a chance to answer the criticism you got uh, from those comments you made uh, a week ago at the dinner, where you said there's an argument that COVID was bio, it was engineered as a weapon to ethnically target different races, and you referenced a study that showed, this, this one study that showed that one of the receptors for, for COVID not being present in the disease for Ashkenazi Jews, and then were criticized that that was an anti-Semitic finding. And I, I've heard some people in the scientific community say, well, that even if that is true of the science that it does, the COVID doesn't have that receptor, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that category of Jewish people would be less affected. And also we don't, have evidence that it was, it's a theory that it was engineered as a bioweapon. I mean, we're still arguing about whether it, I think there's a lot of evidence it could have come from a lab, but you know, we still haven't even settled that question, let alone whether it was engineered on purpose. So how do you respond to those yeah, questions? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, um, my, my statement, you, you made a pretty good synopsis of my statement. I did not say that it was by, that, the, uh, that COVID was, in, I certainly didn't say it was engineered to target certain races. I, I, what I did say is that the United States, China, and Russia are putting large amounts of money into ethnic bioweapons. And then I pointed to a, um, a, an NIH-funded paper, actually a series of papers between 2019 and 2021, that showed um, that receptor sites on the, as you say, the, the, uh, the docking site on the fur and cleave is compatible with the ACE2 receptors in the lungs of certain races, African, uh, people of African descent, most of all Caucasians, and then there's a series of people, ethnic Chinese, one of the le least, um, and a, a number of other races, including Amish. And the, the, with the most uh, incompatible being, in other words, the most protected being Finns, people from Finland. Now, I never suggested that in the real world that the infection infected those people more or less. And I never suggested that it was engineered deliberately by anybody to achieve that effect. There are many, many viruses that have disproportionate effect on races. What the significance to me was as a kind of proof of concept that this is something that bioweapons engineers would pursue. And that's all. Um, I certainly did not mean that uh, it was never intended, never entered my mind that it was engineered deliberately to protect, uh, to protect, to protect Jews and injure other people. 
Yeah, there's something about um, one of the statements that Stacey Plaskett, a representative from the Virgin Islands, made at the hearing today, where she was speaking um, critically of the idea of talking about COVID disproportionately affecting black people in particular, when many of us remember earlier in the pandemic, a lot of sensitive conversations around the fact that instances like the Tuskegee experiment and other bad um, uh, interactions between the black community in the United States and the medical institutions that we have created, I think, legitimate skepticism among black people who were considering whether or not to get vaccinated. So at an earlier time in the pandemic, it seemed like the progressive, dare I say, woke thing to talk about, which is how to encourage black people, despite this legitimate concern they have, to go ahead and get um, vaccinated. And at today's hearing, it seemed like that was flipped on its head somewhat, whereas talking about the fact of there being any disproportionate consequences or outcomes in various populations was evidence of a kind of Ra racism. I mean, what do you make of how your statements have been characterized, arguably mischaracterized in this in this context by Democrats? Yeah, I mean, my statements have been consistently, as I said, I mean, I, I've never made an, an anti-Semitic statement in my life. I, but I, I do talk about the science that, you know, the studies that I mentioned just now were funded by NIH. They were done by scientists at the Cleveland Clinic. They were published, and one of them was published in a, you know, really high impact, high gravitas journal. I think it's UBC Medical, which is the top 10 journals in the country. So I was just talking about the science. I wasn't trying to put interpretations on it. The, you know, the interesting thing is that, that blacks did die disproportionately during COVID. But I doubt if it was because of the virulence of the, anything to do with the virus. I think it was more the disparities in medical care in black neighborhoods and also the, the, the levels of chronic disease in American blacks, for example. Um, blacks were dying in our country at a rate of 3,000 people per million population. In Haiti, which is a poor country, we were told the poor countries were going to be devastated. They had a 1%, a 1.3% vaccination rate, so almost nobody was vaccinated. And they were dying at a rate of 14 people per million population, so one two hundredth of our death rate. The same in Nigeria. The average in Africa was about 320 per million population. That's one tenth of what we had here. So it's unclear. These are all things that need to be studied. But I never believed that it was because the, you know, I don't think, I think it's unlikely that it's because the virus is, is more uh, virulent towards uh, could, uh, Africans. Could those discrepancies, those differences in um, the lethality of COVID be attributed to, you know, different um, yes. uh, ages of the population? Yes. I, I don't know exactly, oh, but the, yes. the average age in Haiti is probably younger yeah, than yeah. here and things like that. Yeah, the, I, the, yes. There are many, many other co-variables. And, and it's interesting. I mean, th these are things that should be studied. So I don't think you can make any conclusion from them. But for example, Japan, which has the oldest population in the world, had a death rate about one tenth the United States. So you know these are things. NIH has a forty-two billion dollar annual budget. We ought to be looking at that and saying why are some people surviving? One, or is it because they took ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine in this country? Is what are the protocols? What are the you know the other differences so that the next time? we have a disease like this, that we actually have some knowledge about it. But those kind of the real questions that you'd want answered are not studied, and that is frustrating. Do you think there's, you know, they talk about hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin. Yeah, I, I've looked at a lot of the studies. It seems pretty mixed to me. I haven't seen a lot of compelling evidence that they did a lot of good. I've seen one argument that um, ivermectin, which can help you if you have a, a parasitic infection, well, if you study the countries where that's more prevalent, where they did a lot of the um, uh, ivermectin studies, th there, was a po there was a good outcome, but it, was, it wasn't because it was fighting, it was making it easier for you to recover from COVID if you also had a parasitic infection at the same time. So I w wonder if there's a skew on the, the, the slight positive that that, have you, have you heard this argument well, before? I, I, so know, it wouldn't be really helpful in the U.S. because there's not uh, widespread uh, parasitic infections. Yeah, I mean, I've looked very, very uh, carefully at the, at the studies. There's now, in fact, I just did an article this week. There are now a hundred studies that show that ivermectin had profound benefits. In, uh, generally speaking, a 70 to 85 percent reduction in hospitalizations and deaths. It, it was really a miracle drug, particularly in the later pand pandemic. 
I'm saying if that was all in like Bangladesh or South no, America, it could be because it was all over the world. Parasites. It was all over the world. It, it, the, the countries where they use it for parasites, in Nigeria, um, which has the highest river blindness burden in the world, did have the lowest COVID death rate in the world. Um, the, they use both. They also have the biggest malaria burden. So virtually the entire population is on my um, on hydroxychloroquine. And a large part of the population is on ivermectin for the river blindness. So, um, and they had almost no vaccination. They had, I think, one like something like 1.3 percent vaccination. So they did very well. But there are states in India, sort of side by side states, like Kerala and Uttar Pradesh, where Kerala used our protocol and had the same uh, comparable death rates, and Uttar Pradesh used ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine and ended the pandemic overnight. But there's there's also if you go in the literature, and there's a there's a doctor called Meryl Nass, who has assembled a lot of these, so that you can go on her website and see them. Or Harvey Reich, who's the Yale epidemiologist, has also assembled them. There's 400 studies mm -hmm. that show benefits from hydroxychloroquine. Over almost 100 studies, I think 99, that show extreme benefits, like devastating benefits of ivermectin. And, uh, and, and there's a handful of studies that are government produced, WHO produced, financed by Bill Gates that say that there was no benefit, but those studies have a lot of problems. Well, Mr. Kennedy, I want to change gears a little bit and go back to something you said earlier, I think, in response to our first question, which is that you bristled at the accusations of anti-Semitism in part because you have the best um, a record on Israel or the best position on Israel as compared to other people in the field or other people in the room or what have you. And I, I wanted to raise this concern, I think, that a lot of folks on the left who are interested in your campaign have, which is that what is considered broadly in American discourse and among the Democratic Party, frankly, among the two-party establishment, to be a good position on Israel is not the, one, the position that many people on the left take. So there was some frustration with respect to you walking back your um, support of Roger Waters, um, the kind of repeated uh, choice to go to Rabbi Shmuley and more conservative members um, uh, of the community when you are being criticized uh, with these accusations of anti-Semitism. Uh, anti You've spoken to about your, quote, unconditional support of Israel. And at a time when so progressives were just kind of tacitly sanctioned in the House for saying in agreement with the international community that Israel is an apartheid state, when the Democratic uh, you know, House caucus is passing a resolution saying, it, it, categorically, it is not an apartheid state uh, against what Amnesty International and all these other groups have said, that it's not a racist state. Is that a kind of censorship as well that you're concerned about? Shouldn't uh, elected Democrats, elected uh, House members have the ability to criticize any nation state without it seeming like it's a violation um, that it needs to be resp responded to with this kind of a resolution, this kind of codified censorship? Yeah, I mean, I think people ought to be able to criticize Israel, and I don't think it's anti-Semitic to criticize Israel. Uh, here's what, you know, here's the distinction. If, you, if you're criticizing Israel and not applying the same standards to neighboring states or other states, if, in other words, if you're, you're making a special category to, uh, to, to criticize Israel that's unique to Israel and letting all the other states do the worse, much worse, that then uh, evinces a bias, and I, you know, let me let me say, tell you why I think the moral case for Israel, and I, you know, that which would take me hours to lay out. But Israel, if you if you want freedom, if you're, for example, a woman, you'd rather live in Israel than any other neighboring countries. If you are a, uh, if you're gay, two weeks ago there was a, a gay pride parade in Israel, 150,000 people at the same time. Iran was hanging gays from cherry pickers in the, in the major cities. If you're, again, if you're a woman, if you want freedom of religion, you've got to be in Israel. There are, there, are, there are Palestinians on the Israeli Supreme Court. Can you imagine there being a Jew on the Supreme Court of any other country in the Mideast? So what I'm saying is, and you know, the, the, the conflicts between the the historical conflicts between the Palestinian and the Israel and, and Israel are, if you look at the history of that, it has nothing to do with what happened in South Africa. This is a historical conflict that Israel has repeatedly made 
huge concessions to try to, to settle. The Palestinian leadership, I think, has let down the Palestinians time and time again. I refuse, Palis the Palestinian Authority pays Palestinians to kill Jews at this point. So there's a, a lot that is disputed in there. But let me just start by saying Human Rights Watch, for instance, qualifies Israel as an apartheid state for the following reasons. It points to um, sweeping restrictions on the movement of Arabs, Palestinians in the region, widespread land confiscation, the imposition of harsh conditions which have led to thousands of Palestinians leaving their homes under conditions that amount to forcible transfer, the denial of residency rights to hundreds of thousands of Palestinians and their relatives, and the suppression of basic civil rights to millions of Palestinians. So I think that many people bristle at this characterization that, well, there's a double standard that people are applying to neighboring Arab nations in Israel. I think most of us would be happy and are happy to point to any number of human rights violations that happen in other countries around the world, including in the Middle East. The question is whether or not, because of our quote unquote special relationship with Israel, the amount of money that we give to Israel, the amount of arms that we fund with respect to the Israeli uh, defense, I think as part in our own military interest, not because of a, I think, particular interest subjectively in the well being of. Jewish people living in the region, that we have an obligation to be more critical of a state that we have so much financial entanglement with. So what do you say to that? That, in fact, the double standard is people who are willing to criticize those other Arab states while ignoring what our own money is funding in Israel. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I think that we can criticize our friends. Israel is the only democracy in the Mideast, and all of those issues, the difficult relationship, between the Palestinians and the Israelis, I, I believe time and time again, the Israelis have in good faith, is various Israeli governments, going back to Ehud Barak, have tried time and time again to settle in the most generous possible terms possible. Uh, if you're dealing with leadership that adopts a charter, then you, that we're not just gonna go after military targets. We are encouraging our people to kill as many Jewish civilians as possible, which is the policy of the PA, the policy of Hamas. Um, you know, there, you look at any country that has security issues, and there's going to be some kind of oppression. When we, during World War II, we're a big country, we put all the Japanese residents, citizens, in concentration camps in our country. Right. And Israel's a tiny country surrounded by hostile countries, each one sworn to the genocidal destruction of every Jew in Israel. So and so they, there is a security issue there, and those kind of security problems require a kind of care and, you know, and, and security precautions that anybody else in the world would, would, be, would be a million times more. So does that justify then something like these um, illegal settlement, settlements that have been roundly criticized by the international community or maintaining Palestinians in what have been described as open air prison type states with unequal access to water and basic um, you know, uh, life, life sustaining provisions? Do you, would, do you condemn the, those, those settlements? It, 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 it's, uh, again, Israel is again and again during the negotiations have offered to close those settlements and to obliterate them and to move their populations out. So out, out, in, out I, into where? Because I think the fundamental issue is that, as, and as a matter of Israeli policy, and fact, this is part fact, of why. If you, if you let me finish, in fact, in polling, the residents of those settlements have have favored closing the settlements in exchange for real peace agreement. So what the Israelis so what is, have said, you know, like? we will close those settlements. We will, you know, we'll, we will trade land for peace. The Israelis have said that again and again and again. In every instance, the Palestinians have refused. So I think so, this is the fundamental issue, is that there are some, I know, some substantive disputes over the timeline of who said no to which kind of agreements and who's at fault for the viability of the two-state solution being increasingly not viable, especially because of the increased expansion of the settlements and the fact that there isn't enough land left, basically, for them to really be an integrated Palestine at this point, which is why the left has moved from a position of a two-state solution to something that needs to be closer to a one-state solution. But the problem with the latter 
And this is why Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, et cetera, have described this as an apartheid state, is that the stated position of the Israeli government is that if we were to fully allow Arab Palestinians to have full citizenship and voting rights because of the population's reality of the states, they feel like they can no longer maintain a Jewish state. And, as, and a stated desire to do exactly that is definitionally, if you, if you want to enforce laws that keep people at various statuses of citizenship within a country, that's how we get to the position where it's an apartheid state. So then how do you square a condemnation of some of those actions on the part of the Israeli government, which we send so much money to, with what you said before, which is that you have this, quote, unconditional support? How can you, and when we have this monetary relationship with Israel, also support unconditional support while having the ability to criticize the actions of a government? Well, I'm, by unconditional support, I don't mean that I'm going to co-sign every action by, uh, by uh, Netanyahu or Likud or whatever, or every or the settlements or you know a, a particular settlement or a particular policy. I don't mean that. I mean that we have a special relationship with Israel. Israel is an outpost of democracy. And, and you know, one of the ways to think about this is that after World War II, um, we developed the same special relationship with Turkey and with Greece because uh, we believe that keeping those countries functional in that part of the world was an important barrier against the expansion of adversaries. Today, we have the Chinese and Russians moving into the Mideast in force. The one ally that we have that is really reliable is Israel. But not only that, Israel is a, an oasis of democracy. It's the only democracy in the Mideast. It's the only, and e listen, even if you're a Palestinian, it's going to be better to be in Israel. If you want to, if you want to criticize your government, you better do it in Israel than any of the surrounding governments. Be before, uh, before we let you go, I want to turn one more time to the hearing you participated in today. You spoke, it seemed off the cuff for your actual opening remarks, like you had something prepared, but then you, you addressed yeah, it. I what, filed my, yes. and Schultz time. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, you spoke about um, <laughs> Americans being at a time of such bitter, bitter division. I mean, the hearing was evidence of, of that division. So much um, strife and disagreement, um, including on COVID matters. Matters, vaccines, mandates, everything. You know, what is your pitch to a public that is wildly divided on even just the subject of vaccines? Uh, you know, whether they're a good idea, whether they should be required, for who, for what age range, how, what kind of effect they had on the pandemic. What is your pitch for some kind of vision where people can, you know, make their own choices about it and let other people make different choices and have that be okay and us all live together in the same country? Yeah, I mean, on that issue particularly, uh, you know, I, I'm character, part of the way of silencing me is by telling everybody that I'm anti-vaccine. I'm not anti-vaccine. I, I was fully vaccinated, not with COVID, but I was compliant with all my childhood vaccines. They tried to use that as a gotcha question today. Well, they were yeah. like, you're vaccinated. Yeah, you're vaccinated. People don't know, and you're and like, I, know, like I heard it a minute before. <laughs> my, my kids were all fully vaccinated. My wife got three vaccines during COVID. My, half my kids got vaccinated by COVID, and the other ones didn't. Um, but I, you know, and we get along as a family. I don't, uh, my job is not to tell people whether to take a vaccine or not. You know, that's up to the individual. My job is to make sure that we have the best science possible. And the problem with, with vaccines, in my view, the reason I've been a critic is because vaccines are the only medical product that do not have to undergo placebo controlled testing prior to license by FDA, the only medical product or medical device. We have 72 vaccines that are now doses that are now mandated for our children. And in many states, they're you know federally recommended, which means mandated in many states. And none of them have, have gone through a pre-licensing safety test with a placebo. And because of that, we do not know the risk profile of those products. And nobody can make a, a rational, common sense, prudent decision about you know the risk and benefits so and that's all i'm saying i'm not saying you know i, I don't want to ban vaccines i don't want to tell people you can't get it you can 
I think we ought to have choice, number one, and we ought to have the best science possible. Mm. I, I've been intrigued by some of the um, kind of structural critiques you've made. Uh, for example, the existence of this National Vaccine uh, Compensation Fund and the fact that there's this limited liability for uh, these manufacturers. And that does seem to tacitly acknowledge that if they were able to be sued for all of the vaccine injuries, that potentially the pharmaceutical manufacturers wouldn't see it as financially viable to continue to manufacture vaccines despite them having these public health issues uh, or benefits. So I wonder, you know, you're, you're saying and you've been very clear that you're not anti-vaccine and that you have taken advantage of vaccine and your kids and family members have uh, taken the vaccines because of their protective value. But as you critique things like the limited liability of pharmaceutical companies and the choice to set up uh, the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Trust, are you concerned that as president, if that trust fund, if that, if that structure were to change, if we were to get rid of that and open up liability for uh, pharmaceutical companies, that the consequence might be that we don't have access to life-saving, um, you know, world-changing vaccines anymore. Uh, I don't think so. And I think that there's, there, there are other ways to do that, but to make sure that the vaccines are safe. I think that's what we have to do. I think we need really good safety testing to make sure that they're safe. And, you know, it may be that there's some vaccines that, you know, people would say, I don't want that one. I don't want a rotavirus vaccine. I don't want to have I don't want a hepatitis B vaccine for hepatitis B vaccines. You get hepatitis. Hepatitis B is spread through, you know, through sexual unprotected sexual activity and, and uh, hypodermic needles. So, um, you know, maybe I will wait till my child's older to get that vaccine like they do in other countries. And people ought to have those choices. That's all. Hmm. Robert F. Kennedy Jr., thank you so much for joining us in studio today. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> More Rising right after this. Twenty twenty four Democratic presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. joins me. Nice to see you. Good to be back, Greta. Okay. Um, uh, anti Semitism. It's a terrible thing. I've got family members who are Jewish, and it pains me immensely. I believe it exists, but there's not one bone in my body that thinks she's anti Semitic. And I just want to tell you that. Not one well, bone in my body. I appreciate that. And I, 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 you know, and I said this under oath today because I'm so angry at those charges. In my entire life, I have never uttered a single anti-Semitic phrase, word, anything, or racist. And, you know, my, uh, you know, because of my family and because I've spent a lot of time in Israel and I have an organization over there, my support for Israel is stronger than anybody in Capitol Hill. I'm the only one who's, uh, who's asked, who's demanded that Biden uh, re retract the $2 billion payment that he's giving to Iran, which is, you know, going to be used for genocidal purposes. Oh, um, you know, I've been smeared by using uh, 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 phrases and things that I've said completely out of context and attributing meanings to them that I had never intended, and it's a way of censoring me, and, you know... And it, I just, I mean, there's, I, I don't think there's anything more painful, you know, for a lot of people, especially who've been, you know, in out there fighting for different causes than to have a false accusation like that. Be, you know, I, I just want to say that, you know, that uh, I get, I know... I'm very grateful for you saying All right. that. All right, now let's turn to government censorship. What's going on with this government censorship? Well, the um, Judge Doty's decision, there's a federal uh, judge in Louisiana. Two attorney generals bought a case against the censorship by the White House. And by the way, the both. My husband has a companion one, full disclosure. Okay. Okay, yeah. <laughs> the, I, and I have three of those lawsuits now. Uh, I was being censored by the Trump White House. Too. This is not a partisan issue. Uh, one of the things that it says in this lawsuit is that I was the first one that was who was censored by the Biden White House. Biden came in on, in uh, January 21st, 2021. On the 23rd, White House officials contacted Facebook and asked them to take my account down. And I lost my Instagram account, which is part of Facebook, three weeks later, 900,000 followers. There was no misinformation on that count. Every posting that I made was cited to a peer-reviewed publication or a, uh, or a government database. They had to invent a new word called malinformation. 
malinformation is, and this is in the judge's decision, is information that is correct, is factually correct, but it is, uh, it is inconvenient or uh, disapproved by the government. So um, many of the things that they were censoring were, uh, were things that had nothing to do with COVID. They were censoring Hunter Biden's laptop. At one point, they were asked to censor a parody of the president and, uh, and Jill Biden. This, uh, this kind of stuff, is, and they were threatened. Why is this happening? I mean, like, okay, I mean, like, we haven't even gotten to AI. I won't talk to you about that tonight. But, yeah. but, but the first, I mean, we have on our lap, you know, this, whole, this thing that's social media, which is wonderful in some ways. But in some ways, you know, we, we now have these other issues. So if elected president, you know, what, what do you do or not do about any of these things? I will immediately, the first day in office, order a, an end to all uh, attempts by federal agents and federal agencies to censor the speech of Americans. Political speech shouldn't be censored. Uh, there's a lot of other things that we can do. You, they we could can, also oversaturate, too. The government could also, you know, oversaturate with the other viewpoint, too, if it wanted to, to combat something that they thought was incorrect. Well, I mean, and that's what, you know, Judge uh, Learned Hand said, is he said that the remedy for bad speech is not censorship, it's more speech, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we also don't want, the government should, should not be able to propagandize the American people. The, and this was a, you know, that was the law until 2016. In 2016, President Obama signed an executive order um, that, uh, that made it now at least get, provided a loophole that allows government agencies not only to censor Americans, but also to propagandize them. And that executive order needs to be withdrawn. You know, I, I was looking forward to today's hearing because I thought there'd be a really good cerebral debate on these issues. And uh, right out of the gate, it got fierce. And, um, you know, it appeared to me that uh, that you know, your own party was was going after you not not for your not for what you've gone not on the issue of censorship but there seemed to be sort of a subliminal message about running against President Biden. Am I wrong to be suspicious of that, or do you think, or do, or do you think it was part of that? No, I mean I think that's clear that that's you know the the DNC does not running want me running against the president. Uh, they first of all they, they you had 102 Congress people signing a letter. Uh, to the committee chair asking that I not be allowed to speak. So they actually tried to censor a censorship debate. And, you know, I wasn't, you know, I was in the debate for a very good reason, which is that... You've been censored. Well, I was, the, you know, I was the key person being censored. I'm all over the judicial decision. And I was clearly censored for political purposes. And, you know, that's what, something the government is not supposed to do. And Democrats and, ought to know that. I mean, you know... Any the, Democrat pull you aside... Any Democrat pull you aside and say, um, you know, I don't, I don't think it should have been handled this way? No, that has not happened yet. But there are Democrats who didn't sign, who didn't sign the, uh, the, uh, the letter. So, and, I, and I'm actually interested in looking at, at who they were. But, you know, it's the DNC and, and uh, the leader of, of the, you know, kind of the attack was Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who was... Used the, to run the DNC. Who ran the DNC and who was, who, you know, was, who was the architect of Bernie Sanders' ejection from the, you know, from the first place. So it's clear, you know, I have a good, my, I have a lot of appeal with rank-and-file Democrats. Our polling is showing that. When you get up to the upper echelons, to the people who want to protect uh, President Biden and make sure that he's the candidate, the party people, I, uh, I'm, I'm fighting an uphill battle. Robert F. Kennedy Jr., hope you come back. Thank you. Thank nice you to see you. Thank you for having me, Greta. Thank you for being here. I'm Robert F. Kennedy Jr. here. Our movement to reclaim our democracy is growing exponentially. But when people ask me how this movement is going to survive the wall-to-wall -wall hostility from the legacy media, from the corporate media, my answer is always the same, it's you. 
You have your own social media accounts, you have your own networks, you have your own communities, and collectively, we have a broader reach than anything that the legacy media could ever dream about. That's why I'm asking you to become a defender of democracy today. Our DOD will be a new kind of grassroots media network powered by you. We're gonna provide you with weekly videos filled with solutions to the world's most pressing issues. By sharing those videos on all your social media sites, you will become an instrument of real change. Every time you share a video, you'll be able to include your own personal Kennedy link, so you'll be able to tell how many new supporters you're bringing into the Kennedy campaign. And I'll be recognizing our top defenders with everything from Kennedy gear to a day of falconry with me and my family or a day of sailing at the Kennedy compound in Ionesport. So if you want to become a warrior for freedom, for truth, for peace, for true prosperity, go to kennedy24.com forward slash DOD and sign up to become a defender of democracy today.